Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Noor Buckles, who I work with on a regular basis for the last eight years that I've been able to put this slide together, and I thank him for allowing me to speak here. Uh, no further ado. Uh, prior to 1980, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy was the only treatment for renal and ureteric calculi that did not pass through the urinary tract. And um, so basically the only option was open surgery because at that time percutaneous nephrolithotomy was still in its infancy. And at that time the open procedures, a range of procedures there which you're all aware of, I don't have to uh, expand on. So the open procedure at that time was aimed to preserve renal function, improve urinary drainage and eradicate infection is which what we would normally do for the advances that we have today. However, it was rarely performed where technology and expertise are now available, and at the time it had a 95% success rate. So what about open procedures? At the time there were loin, subcostal, costal, intercostal approaches. It was major surgery in a lateral decubitus position. Um, at that time, ventilator and monitoring technology was rudimentary. The side effects and slow recovery profile of anaesthetic agents was noted. And there was a lack of intra- and post-operative analgesic techniques. There's also the risk of sepsis, hemorrhage, and deep vein thrombosis. So the Dormia HM3 was the first um, um, lithotripsa non-invasive option for renal and ureteric calcium that were unable to pass through. It had an 80% success rate in non-resistant calculi less than two centimetres with ease of spontaneous passage. Thus, at this time, the approach to anaesthesia was changing dramatically since this first clinical application. So what about this? It was, it was used in conjunction with the water bath and had a very high success rate, 90%. Uh, there was, uh, although unfortunately there was intolerable pain related to the energy density of the shock waves and the size of the focal point. Um, therefore, you had a choice between general or regional and more frequently, more recently, total intravenous anaesthesia. And also anaesthetists needed to understand the physics of ESWL. So what about regional anaesthesia for HM3 ESWL with the water bath? The patient can participate in the positioning in the chair hoist, relies on a single shot to have successful sensory block with a time limit, and hypertension is compounded by the warm bath sitting position and sympathetic blockade. General anaesthesia, again, emphasis on positioning and protection, avoiding soft tissue, neck and nerve brachial plexus injuries, and endotracheal intubation was necessary, and the ventilator parameters as a result could be adjusted to minimise calculi displacement within the target zone. And then you have TIVA, I won't elaborate on that, that's uh, basically total intravenous anaesthesia, but you need, need to be, have conscious sedation because you don't have access to the airway, and uh, you, don't, you want to avoid um, a compromised airway. So what were the uh, issues with this? You had the tendency toward atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, potential malfunction of pacemakers and implantable cardioverted defibrillators. The hydrostatic pressure could compromise cardiovascular pulmonary function and airway access and resuscitation challenges were, were there. And there was the possibility of a transfer of an anaesthetised patient to the main operating theatre. So, Piece of cake? I don't think so. Then you have the piezoelectric, which obviously revolutionised ESWL, and I don't have to elaborate on that. It requires local anaesthetic techniques and analgesic regimens, but it may require repeat procedures. So what about percutaneous nephrolithotomy? It's, as you know, a minimally invasive procedure. It's used for renal calculi greater than two centimetres, and there is a variety of positions that can be done in. And the anaesthetic challenges are markedly different to those of the water bath and HM3. 
I'm going to actually focus a bit on the prone position because I want to actually use that to highlight the benefits of the supine position. And just to touch on, obviously as anaesthetists we do need to know about location and previous location and current location of the stones, whether they are uh, in the renal pelvis, a staghorn or diverticulum, or whether they are at the pelvo-ureteric junction, because this will determine the duration of surgery, will determine what kind of position we put the patient into, whether it's prone, lateral, modified Valdivia, or the flank-free Bart supine position. Or whether we do it under general or regional, whether it's under spinal or spinal epidural combined anaesthesia. And then the surgical history is really important to the anaesthetist. Have they had a previous nephro or ureteral or combined lithotomy? Um, have they had a redo or a failure? Or have they had complications such as bleeding and sepsis? And what about the patient comorbidities? This will determine whether you need to have high dependency postoperatively and whether you need to use invasive monitoring. Of course, we like, we're interested in the renal function. We're interested to know whether the um, operative site is a sole kidney as a result of either an nephrectomy or a non-functioning contralateral side. And we're interested in CT and um, um, serum creatinine and glomerular filtration rate because obviously we, 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 are, we have anaesthetic drugs which are determined, their clearance, renal clearance is important. But we also have drugs which are independent of renal function, such as atricurium and remifentanil, and we're also aware of the nephrotoxic effects of uh, non-steroidal drugs, aminoglycosides and cephalosporins. And then you've got the choice in this situation whether you go for a general or a regional anaesthetic. The cardiac status, you're interested in hypertension, ischemic heart disease, uh, coronary artery bypass grafts and stents, because we know that the cardiovascular physiological changes occur in the prone position particularly. Respiratory function, we're interested to know about chronic obstructive airways disease, emphysema and asthma, because there's a risk of trauma, barotrauma in the prone position and also particularly attention pneumothorax from a high percutaneous approach. Neurological status, what about a history of a stroke, whether it's resolved or whether there's a residual deficit, carotid arterial stenosis and vertebral ballast insufficiency, because these can have an impact in the prone position and there's an increased risk of further cerebrovascular accident. I won't go too much on this, but you obviously have to check about an anticipate, if you've got an anticipated difficult intubation, you get engorgement of the tongue and pharynx in the prone position. There's a risk of displacement or movement requiring replacement of the endotracheal tube, which is logistically challenging. And then again, this is a reason to consider whether you do a general or regional anaesthesia in the non-prone position. Other conditions which are important, the sleep apnea, it precludes prone position under general as there is a requirement for post-operative high dependency. Then you've got <coughs> conditions like osteogenesis imperfecta, there may be a cervical vertebral degeneration, morbidly obese, these are not normally suitable for the prone position. So you've got consent issues when you turn the patient, it can be misleading what side you're operating on. And also the symptomatic kidney may not be the operative one in bilateral urolithiasis. So you've got to ensure the consent clearly states the operating side and the patient is marked for that site. Particularly follow the World Health Organization safety checklist briefing and time out. Language may well be a problem as well as learning visual and hearing difficulties and you need to use hospital advocates. Pregnancy testing, I don't have to elaborate. We have blanket pregnancy testing for all women in childbearing age group because of the implication of congenital defects due to prolonged exposure to radiation from image intensifying and also the effects of anaesthetic agents in the first trimester of pregnancy. Urinary sepsis, it's been discussed and alluded to a lot over the last two days, but you, as you all know, urolithiasis is associated with urinary sepsis and if untreated can progress to septicemia, but equally poorly timed surgical intervention can precipitate septicemia. Urinary sepsis results in a friable genitourinary tract. This increases the blood loss, 
It um, requires perhaps invasive central venous and arterial monitoring, high dependency intensive care unit, and there's a potential for a high mortality, morbidity and mortality. So what are the options? You've got general anaesthesia in the prone position, uh, using an image intensifier, or you can use general anaesthesia spinal or combined spinal epidural in the lateral modified Valdivia or supine position, and there you may use uh, ultrasound or an image intensifier. So general anaesthesia in the prone position, you need to use devices to minimise the increased intra-abdominal pressure, and we have a Montreal mattress for that, which is shown here. And particularly also with patients who have carotid and vertebral arterial stenosis or musculoskeletal abnormalities of the cervical spine, we have a device called a prone view, which neutralises the neck and minimises um, cervical injury and brachial plexus injury. And that's what it looks like. I won't elaborate here, but you can get peripheral nerve injury and direct pressure injury and indirect pressure injury from prone. I'll just focus a little bit on indirect pressure injury because you can get right ventricular compression can result from pectus excavatum and scoliosis and post-cabbage stenotomy. Ophthalmic injury, just to be aware that the prone view keeps the, protects the eyes and avoids any potential for um, post-operative visual loss, which has been described by the American Society of Anesthetists and Spinal Surgery, but can be actually related to um, any patient in the prone position. And it relates to ischemic optic neuropathy due to inadequate oxygenation and central renal arterial occlusion. So general anaesthesia in the prone position, uh, laryngeal mask are contraindicated, there's a risk of airway compromise and there's a lack of protection from acid aspiration. Cardiac arrest is a, is a, a problem. You've got logistic, list, logistical difficulties here. You've got increased transthoracic impedance and anterior displacement of the heart means insufficient energy to the myocardium with posterior paddles. Therefore, you need to return the patient to the supine position for access. Here's, these are not, these are just, I'm not saying that you can't do these patients in the prone position, but I'm just giving you a list of possible contraindications. And if you just have a quick look at that, I've, I've sort of alluded to a lot of them. Um, but I've also others include sort of asymptomatic aortic aneurysm, uh, pacemakers, intracardiac devices, pectus excavation, uh, excavatum, cabbage stenotomy, and so on. So general anaesthesia for the prone position, well, may be a piece of cake, possibly. I don't think so. I think the supine is the way forward. And um, spinal anaesthesia can be performed in the lateral modified Valdivia in the Bart's flank free supine positions. What are the limitations of spinal anaesthesia? You need to get a block level of T6 because the kidney's nerve supply is T10 to T12 and the duration of surgery is unknown. Access to difficult stones and staghorns may require a combined spinal epidural procedure so you can actually top up the epidural. And morbidly obese and musculoskeletal abnormality patients are often technically difficult. What are the factors which determine whether you can do spinal anaesthesia? It's the complexity of the surgery, coexisting patient morbidity, patient compliance and the skill and experience of the surgeon in different positions. So what, what about the choice? A choice depends on these factors. The complexity of the surgery, the coexisting patient, oh sorry, I've, I've done that one. Let's get on to the supine position. And the supine, I just want to mention that this is the sort of the, probably the first line now for our PCNLs at the Royal London and Barts Hospital. It's safe and effective. Um, you've got better urethral access. It can be done in a one stage. There's less patient handling. You only have to drape once. You can do simultaneous PCNL and flexible ureteroscopy. You have reduced operating time and less risk of colonic injury. Um, you, but in the supine, may I actually emphasize, you still have to focus on the position and the protection and the ventilator parameters. 
Uh, when you're doing um, a general anaesthetic, you can use an endotracheal tube or even a supraglottic device, which does save a lot of time. And there you can control the ventilator parameters. In the supine position, unlike the other two positions, the patients are more comfortable and compliant, and it's probably easier for them to, to, to you get a better um, uh, ventilator um, parameters in the, in the supine as compared to the lateral or modified Valdivia. So um, I think the, the advances in the future from an anaesthetic point of view, uh, there is jet ventilation, but whether the risks of jet ventilation would um, contraindicate its use, but it will actually cause, result in minimal displacement of the stone and um, allow for obviously more um, to keep the actual stone in the field. And then obviously you've got laparoscopic and um, robotic surgery which will have some impact on the anaesthetic techniques of the future. And just to finish brief, uh, to finish, I think it's very important now we've got a wide choice of um, surgical techniques, we've got a wide choice of anaesthetic techniques it's very important that the surgeon and the anaesthetist now work as a team, that you actually have a clinical pathway well before you actually arrive at the, um, in the anaesthetic room. And I think it's important um, to, to, to mention about the, the briefing that occurs before an operating list. You have to discuss what kind of position you're going to put the patient in, what kind of technique you're going to use, particularly in terms of ventilation. And just a couple more slides. Uh, a conclusion is really flexibility and choice are dictated by surgical and anaesthetic expertise to provide the best and safest opportunities for patients. Thank you very much.